Kyle. Finally, we get to meet. Finally. Yeah. Cool. I want to do this for a while. Uh, I just want to address a couple of things. Kyle doesn't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a sponsor. <laughs> a little background about the story. Kyle sent me Hivegate to me two years ago. Yeah, yeah. Two years ago. Yeah. I was ignoring this. <laughs> I was a skeptical. I saw some videos on the internet and I was not very impressed. <laughs> Until something clicked. I look at some videos on the internet, I didn't see the results that I would see. I, I just disregard this thing. However, Kyle, genius. <laughs> This works, but only if you do it right. So that's <laughs> yeah. what I want to do here today. We're going to explain how to make this to work because this can be a, a very powerful tool for you to save your hives in the winter, to optimize the chances of your hive to overwinter successfully. Please, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yep, yep. I think this was designed at the beginning to protect against invasion things. Yeah, there was a little bit around uh, environmental control within the hive. Yes. Um, I saw things in tree colonies that I was not seeing in, in our Langstroth, for instance. Yes. Let's use the Langstroth as a standard. Um, Behaviours that of control. And um, so, and that included robbing. And Robin, my, yes. And my, my biggest problem wasp. in our area is yellow jackets. Yes. German wasps, common wasps. That's what I remember yeah. seeing at the beginning and say, okay, that's okay. Yeah. But then this starts to strike me for something that is very important to me about the biology of the bees mm -hmm. and part of the Langstroth hives that I have problems with, which is they do not hold heat in a way a tree can do it. So. Bees only have their superpowers when they're able to control the hive environment. So they need a, to be inside a, a tree that can really protect them from the environmental things. When the bees are able to see that, so they're very picky on how they choose their nest in nature. They choose a specific volume with a specific entrance. And that's the problem to find this in a length straw. It's, a, it's very, the, the, the volume inside is unique. There is no much change. These solve a problem because these allow the bees to have control again, even in a long stroke, long stroke kind of hive. How are we going to say this? Well, so I'll, I'll sort of explain where, yes. where that control comes from, right? Go for it. So if you look at a tree hive, when, yes. they, when they inhabit that tree hive, they've got a blank canvas. True. The internal spaces for them to do with, with what they would like, right? Yes. So what they do, and predominantly this has been shown in science as well, is that they will produce their comb in a way that orientates them to the entrance so they'll build away from the entrance they'll position their brood at the entrance and one of the significant things that i noticed is that they can build their comb down past the entrance so they can be building it past the entrance. so they can be in control of the entrance they can be at the entrance in our langstroth hives the ergonomics forces them away from that it, it limits their ability to have engagement with the entrance so it's an ergonomics thing so the trick to this was, how can I have the bees engage with the entrance? Where is the ergonomic breakdown in our Langstroth design that's stopping them from doing that control behavior? Right, so then once you, once, so now what I've done essentially is I've brought the entrance to where the bees are, I've enabled them to interact with the entrance, and now what we see is a completely different behavior. We see a behavior of control. Full control. We see a proactive behavior, not a reactive behavior. That's really important. And then from that, you get control over the entrance, whether it be for wasps, robbing bees, or cold. Cold it's all and, and different gases. They exactly. can control CO2. Exactly. So what we have now is essentially we have a ducted fan or a ducting that can be used by the bees to create a ducted fan. So we gain efficiencies in air control. We have an um, expansion of the heat within the hive. They can bring the temperature up and hold it up. And hold. Right? It's about retaining what would normally be lost. Yes. 
Now with that, they can keep moisture within the hive suspended in a gaseous form. Okay, which lowers the amount of time, or the low, it lowers the dew point within the hive space, but it also keeps that dew point from forming so quickly, which allows them to keep it in a gaseous form, which then allows them to move it out of the hive at will. So there's little increments in there that are really super important. And, um, and so essentially, again, being able to get them to engage with something, to see that tree behavior, within our Langstroths, and that's what this part here is all about. And so let's, you, let's go it, right? through it. Yeah. So this is going to be inside a Hengstroth hive. So this is the entrance. The yep. bees is going to enter here. Yep. So the swarm is going to be touching here and getting full control of the entrance. Yeah. Gases, whatever get in and out, they control everything. And inside the box here, they're also going to have the control of everything. They're going to be using the minimum amount of energy, meaning to control the environment. For the beekeeper, that's money. Yeah. If the bees spend less honey taking care of themselves and grow over winter, they have, the beekeeper is going to have more, more money at the end of the month. Yeah. And maximize the chances of them to survive three, four months of heavy winter, depending where you are in the world. Yeah. So when I when you saw show me those videos, he, he sent me some videos. I kept the videos around for a while. I decided to look at it. When the bees are connected here, myself alone, through that video, I could identify at least five new behaviors that was not described. Mm -hmm. So I contact people around that was not described, and I think now he's in collaboration with some folks in in the United States uh, and yeah, universities, well, in George, Georgia. Georgia State University, Georgia State. George Meyer, and um, Derek Mitchell from Leeds University. Great. Um, but somebody yeah. going to need to do the work. I have yeah. no time for that. Yeah, yeah. But whoever is a, you know, a behavioral biologist, there is a lot that this little thing were able to show us. And I was very impressed because the bees were showing behaviors that I never saw before. And we could, and now we can learn even more about this beauty of this, what I call the, the best society in the whole planet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, it's really humbling, and um, and I never get tired of it. You know, like there's, yes, we're there's always the learning something. There, there's the slipstreaming. There's the the blocking of the door when it gets cold. Yeah. Um, there's other things happening within the cavity that that are a result of that ability. Um, you know, for instance, we did a trial on, on the, a couple of hives there and over, over a three month period, there was a two kg difference in weight simply because of that blocking of the door. I mean, you think about it, it's like you can have an insulated house, but if you can't shut the door, what yeah. good is it? All right? It's exactly what I was uh, talking. We just replaced our, our windows and, and the energy was there. You, we, yeah. you can see the yeah. profit and losses. Yeah. The PNL is there. The numbers yeah. don't lie. Yeah. Now, so, there's still a impressive. lot of work to do because there's a lot of incremental um, differences between hives, materials that we use, and how, how that affects the bees, the colony itself, and how well they can interact with that to do what they want to do. So the, the, the job we really face is understanding how much do we need to do or what do we need to supply to allow them to do the, the very least work needed to defend against those outside pressures to then be able to concentrate on what they need to do the way they want to do it yeah yeah no oh, very amazing and you also do using two of them can you can you yeah, elaborate yeah. on that do we well, have another one it, it's really it's, it's really about um it's really about control during traffic so in spring what we get is a is a much faster and one up. here yeah and one here yeah so it's just about traffic control. Yes. In winter, we block one off. So the one that's away from the cluster point is blocked off, and then they have full control over one of them. And then in come spring, when it's they're growing into six frames, or roughly about six frames is when I will open the second one. And then that runs all through summer. And then again in autumn, I just go back and block the one off again. What did you see the, about the difference between the two in the spring? Well, um, well, so this is another really interesting thing that people get up, upset about. One versus two entrances. Now I can show I can show behaviors in this where um, there is more behaviors that I don't know. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and one of them is really that that they will ventilate only ventilate out of the hive. 
And when there's two gates, what you've got then is a fresh air going into the hive. In one, and and it all so the venting out draws air in. The venting out is, is stale material. It's old yep. gases, old it's gases. CO2, it's moisture, yes. it's unnecessary heat. Now, if you were to bring that all through one entrance, you're using all that energy that they're using to force that through a space that's now mixing fresh with stale. It's like bringing the gas for your car first through your exhaust. And it's, it's really, really inefficient. So when you have two, two. you have the circular system going on. They're drawing air out of the hive by fanning. They always do that. And then that sucks air into the hive through the other entrance. And then they can make a link between the two to do work with it, right? Now, um, I can show you video of them of this clockwise motion of them oh, coming in you're through the send fan. Me those right? videos, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it and it really demonstrates the fact that they understand that circular thing. So you think about when a, in a in a dark hive, how do they know where the front door is? Well, if you look at the videos, you can see them fanning out, drawing air in, yeah. and you'll watch the bees walking around, say an undertaker bee, walking around trying to find the entrance, and you can watch them going for half an hour, and they're walking around, and then they get into that incoming yeah. stream, stream, and they just go boom, okay. and they're out. So it's that incoming stream which helps them in the dark to locate to where locate the entrance is, right? Well, yeah. the reason I'm asking that, I always have a reason for my question, <laughs> is for the beekeepers, Normally people think about that overwintering, but there is another thing that we can consider when there's a lot of heat. Mm. Mm. In a, I came from Florida. We have a lot of commercial beekeepers there. With, and the, the problem they have there is a lot of heat. So the bees spend a lot of the time and the money, the honey, mm. ventilating money from the beekeepers going away because they, can, they have hives that cannot control the heat very well. Yeah. With this, it, it's going to maximize the energy conservation there. Yeah. So I, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's going to happen. Yeah, this, and part of that behavior that you'll see in the videos I can show, another behavior is um, in a normal hive, the ventilating bees inside the hive will be every square inch or so. And there's a whole lot of them trying to gather air and force it through a hole, right? Yep. In this, what you'll see is the bees lining up nose to tail, slipstreaming like race cars on a track. Yep, yep. Super efficient. I remember that. Right? So what you've got is an airflow going past them because they're dragging it. Now, that in that slipstreaming form, they've got one bee worth of restriction, but they've got multiple bees worth of fans. And you just need a couple of bees to generate yeah. so much Heat. power. Yeah, Instead of a lot of bees outside doing ventilation, yeah, you just yeah. need a, a row with the six or seven. Yep. And that's it. Yep. And you can watch them. They'll come into the tunnel and they'll just mull around and they're sensing yep. what's coming out. And then they go, okay, I need to join that line and they push themselves yeah. in there. It's really funny. Do, to you, watch. do you mind to show those videos? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. Give me the, yeah. the yeah. ability to show in my yeah, channel. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, would, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Well, after watching this interview with Kyle, I feel that something was missing. I think uh, a very good demonstration of how to use, how to place, how to connect the things was missing in this explanation because I didn't have a full hive uh, to, to demonstrate. So I'm going to cover that when I bring Kyle live to my show so we can show not only the a full demonstration where exactly you're supposed to put the hive gate, but also all the videos that we talk about with the different honeybee behaviors. So stay tuned. And until then, thanks for watching. Inside the Hive.TV, the show about bees. See you guys in the next video.